Hey everyone, welcome to Thrive with Asbury Seminary. I'm your host, Wes Wilcox, and my guest today is Andrew Peterson. Andrew is a recording artist, songwriter, producer, filmmaker, publisher, and award-winning author of The Wingfeather Saga. Andrew is also the founder and president of The Rabbit Room, which has published 30 books to date and fosters community and spiritual formation through music, story, and art. In our conversation, we talk about faith and creativity, finding your identity outside of the things you do, and Andrew shares what he's learned from 20 plus years of storytelling in songs and books. So let's listen. Hey, Andrew, thank you so much for coming in today. I know you got a lot going on today and tomorrow with events and things, so appreciate you taking the time to do this. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so as we get started here, I um, want you to talk about a little bit, how did you fall in love with music? And when huh. did that start? Uh, I liked music as long as I can remember. I have this weird memory of uh, trying to write songs when I was like seven. I had a oh, little, wow. you know, tiny little spiral notebook, and my uh, my brother or somebody found the lyrics, which were just all these like love songy lyrics, whatever. And uh, which that doesn't make sense if I was seven. Anyway, I don't. It's a foggy memory, and uh, and I was so deeply embarrassed by it that I I flushed the them down the toilet so nobody would find it and i basically didn't share my music with anybody publicly for many many years because i was so it was a very private thing so i think that was how i i i fell in love with it in a very private way Hmm. like i I liked the way that it certain songs made me feel there was a lot going on inside me when i would hear certain kinds of music um but i didn't always feel comfortable sharing that uh because i didn't have words for what was going on but for as long as i remember art and specifically music, st- stirred something in me that I couldn't explain. Yeah. So when did you start playing instruments? Uh, I mean, I took piano lessons as a kid, and, and I, I'm a really bad student. And so, you know, I, I, I'm i always more interested in doing the thing that I'm not supposed to be doing, you know? And so as long as I had piano lessons, I wouldn't practice. But as soon as I quit piano lessons, I played constantly. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it was nice being a pastor's kid because I had the piano in the fellowship hall at my disposal. You oh, know? Yeah. And so I could we lived in the parsonage right next to the church. So I would always sneak into the church and, and play when nobody else was in there. And by high school, I had this elaborate uh, system for sneaking out of the house and into the church and into the auditorium where I would sit in the dark and turn on the little light um, over the piano and play for hours. Hmm. And so I just loved the piano and um, and eventually the guitar in high school. But at the time I was I was a I, I loved to draw too. I like I wanted to go to art school and um, and my dream was to be a pa- Batman comics penciler. I wanted to pencil I, Batman. I comics. had heard that, so I was going to ask you about yeah, that. Was, was Batman your favorite character? Yeah, he was. It was uh, just, I think as an Enneagram 4, I know now <laughs> that it was speaking to my sadness. Uh, <laughs> but Batman the loner, you know, and the kind of gothic kind of spookiness oh, yeah. of him was yeah. intriguing to me. And uh, anyway, I loved to draw Batman. And in my dinky little high school, I was kind of the art guy. And then I went and interviewed it at an art school and realized that I was not good enough to make a career out of it. And I, well, it, I w- would say this, I maybe could have been, but I didn't love it enough mm-hmm. to do the work that it would take to make a career out of it. Yeah. But I did that. So I remember interviewing with the, um, the, the, whoever there was at the school, Savannah College of Art and Design. And yeah. the guy was looking through my portfolio and he said, hey, these are fine, but none of these are really finished. And there was this awkward, my parents looked at me and I had thought they were awesome because in my little tiny school, they were cool. But I realized he was right that they weren't finished. And the reason they weren't finished was because I was spending all my time playing the guitar and the piano. And I was way more interested in that. And so that's the, that's kind of the horse I rode out of town was music. Yeah. 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 Do you remember the first song that you learned where it felt like, now I can really play this instrument and I can play yeah. things that I like. Like what was um, that? It you? would have been, I mean, the first song I ever learned on the guitar was a song called Patience by Guns N' Roses. Oh yeah. Which was like the perfect song to learn on the guitar for the perfect first song. Cause it's, you know, it's, it starts out in C and it's got all the basic stuff you're going to need to know. Um, but yeah, I remember that lighting me up partly because I was a piano kid. So I was learning all these journey songs and, <laughs> Billy Joel songs and that kind of stuff. And uh, 
but the guitar was mobile. I could, I wasn't bound to the church fellowship hall. I could carry the guitar to the end of the dock and at the lake, you know, and, or go out in the woods and play. And so something about that lit me up and, um, and I still love them both, but the guitar kind of took over. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so in, in your career as an artist, and you've had over two decades doing this professionally, when you think about your identity, how have you kept your identity from getting wrapped up in this thing that you do of creativity and whether it's music, art, writing books, mm -hmm. um, and has that been a struggle for you? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I think the, the best antidote to identity issues is probably church. Um, being a, a, a member of a, a church that where people aren't super impressed by you <laughs> uh, and you can go and serve quietly, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, as, as like an antidote to the, you know, if you're a person that's out front a lot, find a way to serve in a way that's not out front. Um, and uh, and also just being a part of a community of, of Christians. Like I had one of my good friends in Nashville, we've been friends for like 25 years. He didn't listen to my music for the first probably five or six years of our friendship on purpose huh. because he, he was like, I wanted to f be friends with you. I wanted you to know that I was friends with you, not because I cared about your songs, but because I knew you. Yeah. And I wanted to be able to tell you if I didn't like your music. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, the, turns out he does, you know, it was kind of nice. He was like, I was kind of relieved when I finally let myself hear your music that I didn't hate it. Uh, <laughs> but it, there's a real, uh, when I get home, you know, off the road and I pull up to my, my house and I know that there are people there who really know me, mm -hmm. um, not, not the version of me that I present, um, that it, it, that's roots you pretty firmly. Uh, they, they remind me who Jesus is and who I am in Christ. That's kind of one of the great things about mm, singing in church and going and receiving communion is, is that you're surrounded by all these other broken people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, especially if you're a person who has any kind of public facing life, mm -hmm. it's just super crucial to stay plugged into your local church, I think. Yeah. And I'm sure having a friend like you described and, and your family as well Yeah, to keep you grounded and remind you like, Oh yeah. 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 And so I've, I noticed, I, I didn't come up with this, but I saw somebody else do this when somebody says, Hey, tell us about yourself. I always make sure that I open with my family, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, to not just to say, look how cool I am. I, I don't identify with music. It's because I do and I need I need to fight back, you know. Yeah. And so having uh, being able to talk, introduce myself as the husband of Jamie and the father of Aiden Asher and Sky and uh, a member of this ch church or this community yeah. um, keeps the, me from getting the cart before the horse. Yeah. And I think that's important kind of no matter what your profession is or whatever the thing is in your life, because we all have things that um, we can let define us mm -hmm. that aren't the thing that should define us. Right. And, yeah. yeah. So to go a little deeper on identity um, in a slightly different way, within your career, um, you're now you're known for a lot of different things, but um, <clears throat> within your music, um, has there ever been a time where you've, written a song when you're by yourself and been like, I really love this song. But within my artistic brand, if you want to call it, uh -huh. I'm not sure people would accept that. And I don't <laughs> mean it like content wise, that right, it's, right, right. but like just a Style song or something yeah. that they, you're just like, I don't know that I can put that out, but I really <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It's probably happened to some degree before, but for, for me, it's, it's, it's been less about, uh, it's been like I, I make I not why I'm stuttering the the I try to make records not just songs, mm -hmm. and so the way that I've tended to do it is to you know I used to write songs constantly mm -hmm. when I was a young man I was on fire and I just couldn't wait to get by myself and had notebooks full of song ideas but the older you get the more other interests kind of take over and and I began to realize that's okay that the other interests are feeding the part of you that is the songwriter. And so when I, I would sit down to write a song, um, it was the first time in two months that I'd really tried, but I had all this, I had two months of life that I had lived, yeah. not as a songwriter, but as just a, a person. <laughs> and so, uh, 
So all that to say that like when I um, would go into the studio to put out an album, I was always thinking about the songs in terms of their relationship to each other oh, okay. and their relationship as a whole to this um, to this idea or this concept, you know, so just as kind of uh, it's, it's maybe a crutch. It's kind of a, a way to um, give yourself a picture frame yeah. to paint inside of. Yeah. And so uh, so, yeah, that I typically wouldn't write something that wasn't authentic that like the more you do it the more you find your own voice mm -hmm. and you more the more you may find that your voice is is uh, has got colors to it that you didn't know were there you yeah. know so there's a part of me this probably won't happen but i've thought about um going in the studio I, i've had the idea like i would love to get my bluegrass friends and do a bunch of bluegrass songs together oh yeah and then to go over here and with the band that plays the resurrection letters tour and do a rock album oh. and then do an album of uh uh, singer songwriter stuff in the middle and release all three at once <laughs> oh <that'd be laughs> just, just to kind of say to people like hey it's still me because there is yeah. a little bit of all of those things in it um that sounds like a massive project but <laughs> but that is a part of me is like yeah the part of the fun of being an artist is is um hacking away at the at the hunk of marble to find like what, what else is in there you yeah. know um paul simon's a great example of that like oh, he yeah. he you know from the Simon and Garfunkel days to his l most recent stuff, it's still Paul Simon. Mm -hmm. But man, the colors have changed. Oh, the, yeah. the facets of the kinds of songs he written, he's written have, have changed over the years. So I'm in, that's inspiring to me. Yeah. So kind of in the same vein, how do you feel that your art expresses your own story? Um, how do I feel that my art expresses my own story? Well, I, I, that's the kind of... Um, art that got my attention mm -hmm. when I was a young man. So, you know, I was listening to you know, hair metal and uh, rock and roll. I was always on the hunt for something. I didn't know what it was. So my tastes were pretty broad. And uh, it wasn't until I discovered, you know, James Taylor and Rich Mullins, oh, yeah. uh, some of Paul Simon's stuff. Uh, Mark Cohn is one of my favorite songwriters. But uh, it was that they were telling stories mm -hmm. and I got the sense that their stories they they weren't like Paul Simon will do this like fictional kind of thing he writes from a character's point of view a lot and I'm sure the other writers have done that too but I did get a sense that I was getting a peek inside their hearts mm -hmm. and so like Rich Mullins for example when he would you know he would write these big corporate songs but he also had a had songs that mentioned Wichita mm -hmm. or uh, you know there's a song called The River that I love, where he, the second verse he says, maybe she could come to Wichita, maybe we could borrow Beaker's bike, let the road wind tie our hair in knots, let the speed and the freedom untangle the lies. And like, there is a lot of story in those two lines, right? Yeah. Like, who is she? Who's Beaker? Uh, what were the lies? How is this bike ride gonna like heal them, this relationship that's broken. So that I'm super, I, I was very intrigued by those kinds of songs where um, not just I'm, I'm listening to their story, but I'm bringing my own DNA to the story and it's helping me interpret what's going on over here too. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, so there's this really fascinating kind of principle that Rich exemplified, I think, where uh, one of his album titles is The Winds of Heaven, The Stuff of Earth. And so he had this really high ability to write with this high lofty almost tolkien-esque poetry but he also said ain't and yeah. wrote about wichita and so so there was this wonderful groundedness to it um where you you could write about these high and beautiful spiritual things but all of a sudden you plant them in the earth and you're reminded that these things work together you know yeah. that this isn't just some theoretical thing that it took on flesh and dwelt among us Right. And so that idea was so fascinating to me as a songwriter that that you can write about the idea, but it really um, gets my attention when the idea suddenly has shoes on yeah. or is in a town on a certain street. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that that to me gave me permission to tell my own story, you know, because you, you, you can start with the idea and then. Uh, and then uh, discover that it is grounded somewhere. Or more often, you start with the ground. You start with like what you have, and you look around and you tell this story, and then as you write the song, you realize that there is some beautiful truth that's kind of buried in it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so 
it's those writers that were saying, hey, here's my story, such as it is. I'm just going to tell my story. And, um, and as a Christian, I think, yes, you do that, and then you trust the Holy Spirit with the results. Yeah. Um, and that's been one of the things about your music that has touched me so much is that personal side of it. And um, because that is, to me, I relate more to songs that have stories in them that tell me something and uh, about the artist. Mm -hmm. And also, like you said, we can reflect our own stories on that. Even if what you've experienced is not what I've experienced, right. but through that song, there's this place where we come to see our own stories in a different totally. way. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And I think, the, you know, as a writer, the more specific you can be about that stuff, the, the more chance you have to, to uh, find common ground. Yeah. You know, it's, it's counterintuitive because you think, oh, well, it's so specific. It's just about my story. Um, but that's actually the bedrock that where you'll hit this, this uh, seam in the earth that connects everybody. It's just amazing. So, like, I there's a song called um, "Silver Thunderbird" by Mark Cohn, where he, about his dad, and it's such a good song. But it was his dad loving cars and uh, being a little boy and watching how proud his dad was of the Silver Thunderbird or whatever. And uh, it's just a great song with all these little vignettes, pictures of his childhood, and it is nothing like my childhood. Nothing. N none of the details are the same. Uh, but I always think of my dad when I hear that song. And I think, like, it, like, I see the movie play out in my head of the song that is not of my dad, but the song helped me know and love my dad better. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so be specific, tell your story. Uh, which that's a, uh, Frederick Wigner is a writer that I, I love, and he writes a lot about paying attention to your life. Pay attention to your story, because your story is one of the, one of the ways uh, that God is making himself known to you, you know? So if you look at it through that lens, then it's all redeemable. Nothing is wasted. No part of your story is wasted. It, it all has the ability uh, to be redeemed. And, um, and so as a writer, you get this privilege of investigating, you know, yeah. going, okay, well, here's a thing that happened to me, or here's a memory that I can't let go of. What do I do with that? Why is it stuck up in here? And, you know, one of the gifts of being a poet or a writer is that you get to s spend a ridiculous amount of time trying to understand that. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you're lucky, share it with somebody else and say, look what I found. And then that helps them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're writing, you talked about being specific, but do you have to have, I'm sure you do have a filter there that it's like, well, I can be honest, but I have to, <laughs> yeah. there's a way to do that. Totally. You can't yes. just put all of your whatever yeah. out there. Um, so how do you, how do you think about that when you're writing? Sure. Um, you, uh, I have failed at this a lot over the years. Um, these are, these are like hard earned opinions <laughs> that I kind of learned from having done it wrong. So for so many years, but there is this weird balance between, uh, when you are in it, when you're in the middle of a painful season, mm. Uh, definitely write about it. Like if, if it's therapeutic to you or helpful to you to understand or a prayerful way for you to engage with your own pain, do it. But don't necessarily share it publicly. Um, it's good to write these songs. These songs might need to like be little seeds that are, you, you let rest for a season or two before you plant them by putting them on an album or, or sharing them publicly. And it's tricky because like I, I think that that's probably the wisest way to do it. However... Sometimes it can be incredibly powerful to share the song you wrote yesterday about the yeah. thing you're going through. Um, so the trick to me is, or the, the filter that I have learned to try to use is, you know, art ought at its best is a way of loving. Um, and it's not super loving to your audience to put a burden on them that they mm. didn't sign up for, you know? Yeah. And so you can make the audience your counselor, you can bleed on them, you know? And so that then it becomes about you and you're working something out as opposed to here's a thing that that happened to me and maybe it can help you. And so if your attention is on on the audience, then you can ride that line and sometimes it can work. But in general, I think the principle is Walt Wongren Jr. said this uh, because he wrote a lot of great memoirs about his time as a pastor and um, he's often the villain in the story. You know, he'll write these stories about 
the, these knuckleheaded things that he did or said and how his congregation loved him through it, you know. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked him at, at a rabbit room conference, like, how do you know when it's okay to share that story? And he was like, you, you need to be um, far enough away from the story to where you can see the the lord's arc of redemption in that story does that make sense yeah so anybody who's gone through any kind of depression or tough seasons like for me uh i knew it was over when i realized one day that i was talking about it in the past tense mm -hmm. <laughs> i didn't there's no like clear moment when you're like now my depression has ended yeah or the the season of suffering is over you just you'll realize over a conversation with somebody that you said yeah i went through this thing and that's when you go whoa I guess, I guess it's now springtime. It's not winter anymore, you know? And so that's when you know enough uh, about your own heart and about what the Lord has been doing to, to then stand on the stage and make it about the people that you're loving as opposed to uh, yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's, that's very wise and um, a good way to put that because I've wondered that with artists and like, how you decide these things. So that's and pastors too. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, definitely people who pastors. stand on the stage and have yeah. to write a sermon every week, which I can't imagine doing. Yeah. Uh, like, yes, share your story. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. pastors ought to be able to stand up and talk about their story. Uh, but there can be a wrong way to do that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, um, so going in a little bit of a different direction, um, for over two decades, you've been doing this touring, um, I'm sure that's been hard, uh, staying on the road and doing that. And plus these other avenues that we'll get to later with the books and sure. the many other things you're involved in. But how have you balanced having a family and just the immense amount of responsibilities you have with that alone with continuing to pursue your art and your career yeah. and travel so much? Um, honestly, I haven't balanced it. Like it, it has been, it's, it's been like uh, carrying a marble on a tray, you know, it's always swinging from one, one side to another. Uh, I, yeah, it's just a long struggle of trying to figure out, like I'm, I was just telling a friend of mine this yesterday that I'm always haunted by the feeling that I'm doing it wrong. I don't know if you know what I mean, but like when your work is frustrating or you're haggard, you're just so tired from having bitten off more than you could chew or like the things aren't working the way they're supposed to work or whatever. Um, like it's hard for me to tell, is this just, this is the curse and this is thorns and thistles and uh, infesting the ground and uh, just kind of, this is the price that, that you're going to experience frustration in your work on at some level, as long as, you know, the earth remains unhealed. Um, and on the other hand, God did give us real Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. he, he gave us uh, tools to fight back at the curse. And so I'm always struggling with like, am I, am I um, doing too much or am I, I don't know, is this imbalance my fault or is it because I'm not doing this wisely or is it this is just part of the deal? And sometimes if you're a farmer, you just got to stay up all night harvesting. Sometimes it's just really hard and you just got to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I, I feel like the last 30 years of my life has, has been like one long question mark hovering over the, <laughs> my head. Like, because I, I believe deeply in the work mm -hmm. and I, like, I believe that these things are kingdom building and important to do. And, uh, and I feel, you know, a certain gifting toward some of this stuff. Um, and I also often feel like, I am completely spent and worn out and have not been good at keeping Sabbath. I have not been good at, uh, you know, really necessarily maintaining deep relationships. You know, our family has has flourished, you know, like the kids are, are all good. They're OK. <laughs> but we've had a lot of talks as a family about, you know, how do we survive this crazy lifestyle where. We're on the road a lot. And so we would take these drastic measures like, you know, I'm going to do this tour. I'm going to be gone for two months. But when I get home, I'm home for two months. And like we're going to save up enough money to go here and rest for a while. And so we're always trying to like it's more tactical than strategic, you know, like uh, trying to figure this thing out. So I don't know. The, the short answer is just I don't know. I, I'm, I'm 
I'm not sure that I've done a great job of it. But the good news is it's not on me to make good of that. You know, mm-hmm. like I felt like, uh, um, so a quick story that, uh, there's a longer version of the story, but the short version is just that when my son Aiden was moving out of the house and into college, <clears throat> I was a giant mess because I was so sad that he was leaving. I loved him, still love him, obviously. But the uh, uh, I, the main thing I was feeling as we were packing up his room and loading the car was regret that I had not been more present. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about plays that I'd missed at, as a you know touring musician or you know all, you know to a finer point like the. He's an artist. He's a visual artist, amazing artist. So he's doing the thing that I wanted to do when I was a kid, but he's a, like, I'm a huge fan of what he does. And I was like thinking about all the nights that my wife and I were downstairs watching some show on Netflix while he was upstairs drawing. Mm. And I was like, Netflix? Like, why would I have watched a single show in my life when this amazing image bearing human being was like, my little boy and I, I wasn't, so I was, that's where my brain was going, you know? And Aiden, of course, was just like pops. Like we watched a lot of Netflix together and we had a great time watching shows <laughs> and like, like you taught me about storytelling and blah, blah, blah. And so kind of like pushing back at like this narrative that I was building where I was a complete failure or whatever. Um, so the point is I, I, he kept saying, you're a good dad. Don't worry about it. And I was like, yeah, that's not helping. And Jamie would say, Andrew, don't beat yourself up. You're a great dad. You've been here for the kids. And the kids were all like, what's he going on about? He's so sad. And I just felt like whatever. And so I ended up bumping into this older professor the next day at college, a friend of mine. And um, he was like, how are you doing? And I was like, man, I'm just so full of regret. And he laughed. And he said, oh, I remember feeling that way too. Um, But it has been so amazing to see the way the Lord has redeemed my mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, I, you know, everything that everybody else had said, no, you're a good dad, didn't ring true. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is, like, my hope is not on me being a good dad. My hope is in that the Lord will redeem my failings and make good of my bad dadness, right? And so uh, that's the gospel. The gospel is not you're a good dude. The gospel is God is going to make you new. Right. Yeah. And so uh, I I feel like that as a parent when it comes to this balance question um, and as a husband and as whatever, like, yes, I'm trying to figure it out. Yes, I want to make it uh, make good decisions and say yes to the right things and no to the right things. And I also have to rest in the fact that I'm not going to get it right and that uh, that will not thwart God's intention. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. And. I think all of us in some way or another, we have those regrets and those things and the voice in our head that says, you didn't do enough or you're not doing that right. And um, to have people to push back against that. And Well, what you need is people to say, no, you didn't do it right. That's not the point. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's like, that's the nice thing. The relief that I feel in me is when I'm like, you know, if you're writing a song and you think you have to write the greatest song of all time versus... (laughs) You just got to make something. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes the Holy Spirit whew, inhabits it and does this thing. But you can't let your fear of messing it up stop you from doing the thing. There was a, there was a moment when, uh, <laughs> this is kind of an embarrassing story, but I, my neighbor, uh, we live kind of in the country, and so it takes hours to mow the, the, the field uh, sometimes. But our neighbor has a big field. And we knew that they had a funeral that week and that they were really busy and he was kind of overrun with trying to get their property ready. And I was like, you know what? I've got a couple hours. I should go mow his yard. And then I was like, yeah, that that would be a good neighborly thing to do. And then I was like, wait, but would I be doing it because I wanted to help him or would I be, you know, overcome with feelings of pride because I'd been such a good guy that I'd mowed his yard? And I remember sitting there for like 10 minutes and I had almost talked myself out of not mowing his yard because I was questioning my own motives. <laughs> and then I could, it was all like a screw tape letters moment where I was just kind of like, the enemy wants you to talk yourself out of doing the good thing because your motive isn't per- perfect. Mm-hmm. Just shut up and go do the thing. God will take care of your motives. If your motives are bad, he'll still make good out of what you did. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. And so like, I'm just trying to get better ab- about go mow the yard. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't second guess 
questions of work-life balance, blah, blah, blah. Do the work. Um, do it in community. Submit to your church and your people and and then watch how the Lord kind of makes uh, makes beauty out of the chaos that you've been so. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know if this is a Enneagram 4 thing or not, but the overthinking, that is a huge, huge mm. problem for me and prevents me from stepping out and doing a lot of things. Yeah. So I Good. relate yeah. a lot to that. Um, you talked about your kids. What's it been like getting to tour with your kids and oh. with your daughter? And I've been yeah. to a couple of shows. Your son played drums. And mm-hmm. I mean, that's got to be the most satisfying. It thing. is. It is the yeah. most satisfying thing. Yeah. Uh, truly, like it, we're uh, we pinch ourselves like and the cool thing is they're all married now and, and we like everybody they married. Well, and uh, they're they're just good people. Um, and and the cool thing is like what a gift to get to. You know, in their own way, they're each doing creative work, uh, but it's all unique. Like they're not doing, they're not, they're all in a band together called Wake Low, which is, I mean, they put out one record during COVID uh, called, uh, that is just this amazing, one of my favorite albums. Um, So please go check it out if you're listening. Um, But they're also like, uh, we have these other things we're doing. This is a side thing, you know, Mm -hmm. Aiden loves doing this visual art he's a book illustrator he he's a background painter for the wing feather saga animated show and his wife is too they met in animation school wow. and then asher is a drummer but he's also a record producer and tour manager and he runs front of house for some some really amazing bands and wow. um and his wife supports him in that role amazingly. And then Sky just married a songwriter. <laughs> so Sky's a singer songwriter. She married this guy, Tom, who's also a really excellent songwriter. And so she's the, you know, the one who's writing the songs. Asher's producing the songs. Aiden's making books and pictures. And I just sit back and go, you know, if I didn't know any of these people, I would be a huge fan of what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I don't know people are like, how did you foster this in your life? Oh, I was going to ask that. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I would argue the lion's share of that is my wife um, being just this incredible present person. She's she's like, a, she's the one who will sit and talk at the dinner table for two hours. And I'm the one who gets antsy and wants to like, what are we doing next? Mm-hmm. Right. But she just has no problem just shooting the breeze and sitting there. And the kids flourish with that like they're like i'm in some ways dudes want to go do stuff <laughs> and jamie jamie's turns out that's not really true sometimes dudes want to just sit and talk to their mom for two hours mm-hmm. it's beautiful mm-hmm. um and so i uh i think that she's just cultivated this really healthy um, culture in our home and in our life uh and she married into this weird creative world you know where I'm making stuff, but also our community of people in the rabbit room, you know, the, the, so the kids grew up with this healthy balance of, of really uh, Jamie modeling presence and real affection and hospitality. And then this whirlwind of a creative community. And the kids have grown up seeing that it's okay to be a Christian and to make music or to draw comic wow. books or to whatever. So, um, yeah, I can't take a whole lot of credit for how cool they are. But that's an awesome gift to give them an environment where they can see that and see you living out what God has put as a passion on your heart Mm -hmm. and see you do that and know I can do that too. Yeah. And um, I'm sure that's a great blessing. It really is a huge blessing. Yeah. So the the my new book uh, is called A Ranger's Guide to Glipwood Forest, uh, kind of like a an addition to the Wing Feather Saga came out a few days ago and Aiden illustrated the book. So I got to sit at the book signing next to my, my grown son. (laughs) He's 25 with a big, I'm a grandpa now and, and do the book signing with him. And we were both texting each other after the show. And I was just like, I can't believe I get to do this with my kid. And he would text me back to like, I can't believe I get to make fantasy novels with my dad. Like what a crazy, wonderful gift it is to, to, to be, like a genuine fan of the work that he's doing, you know, yeah. and, and uh, in addition to that, he's just a good man and a good dad. So we, we are pinching ourselves. And and I also know it's not always going to be smooth sailing. You know, there's going to be stuff that is going to come, but it's really fun in the seasons where everything's kind of like firing on all cylinders. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you about the new book. Um, so how, how long did you guys work on that? Cause I know um, it just came out. 
It just week, came out. So. Yeah, yeah. It was. I think we signed uh, like signed the contract with the publisher uh, sometime in the middle of last year. Okay. Because um, <clears throat> the books have been doing really well, and so they were they were like, "Hey, do you have any other ideas for fun <laughs> things?" And so I had been thinking about a book like this for a while, and then they are making a uh, a picture book, like a kid's picture book, out of one of the stories. Oh wow! And then there's a graphic novel that's in the works for book one. Oh uh, wow! Which again, like the Batman kid in me is like, yeah. oh, there's a graphic novel. Yeah. Uh, same thing with the show, though. I grew up loving movies and animation, and, and uh, watching that happen has been fun. But yeah, it was just like a pretty short writing experience experience because um, the uh, because it's like this accessory book, you know, it's not supposed to be an epic four book thing. It meant that I just, I'd already built the world, you know, it's, I was telling somebody 20 years ago is when I started working on the Wingfeather Saga. So it's, it's been about that long that I've been swimming around in these waters. And so, and then the show is like another experience of further building the world and exploring the edges of things. And so when it was like, well, write a guide to the forest, I was like, oh my goodness, I know it so well now. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. But it was mainly just fun. Like I, it was like three weeks of me just being a 12 year old kid and imagining uh, the book that I would have loved to have read, you know? Um, so it's funny because the people have been in the interview, like the publicity stuff, a lot of the podcasts and stuff have been these Christian writer podcasts. And they're like, what, what spiritual lesson do you hope kids get out of this new book? <laughs> And it's like, well, it's called A Ranger's Guide to Glipwood Forest. Um, uh, I just want them to have fun. Yeah. I want I want them to just feel a flutter in their tummy and get lost in the world. Um, and and I think that's okay, you know, yeah. uh, for the book to live in that world. And the the this is a side note, uh, but the you know the Wing Feather Saga. I, I mentioned this earlier, but it, it, I wanted it to not be overtly Christian, but deeply Christian, like I. I wanted it to do things, but also I didn't want to be in charge of that. I wanted to just tell the best story I could tell and let the Holy Spirit work on it the way that he wanted. You know, and that said, there were things that I wanted people to get out of it, right? Um, there are themes that I was like, gosh, yeah, this is this is something the Lord's doing in me that I'm going to see what how that looks in this story. Yeah. Um, but in the in the TV show, you know, adapting it from... The screenplay to the, or from the book to the screenplay has been this really fascinating ex process because the screenwriters are, are adapting it and then I'm reading their scripts, you know, and making notes and they go through like seven revisions. And we're trying to, you can't do a one for one, you know, it just yeah. doesn't, nobody would want to watch that shit TV show. Um, so, yeah, the adaptation is, is tricky. Uh, but there will be these moments where, <laughs> Uh, in the early drafts where the characters will say these things like, son, you know, you need to stick together because it's important to do this and and fight for the right because it's good and there is darkness in the world and all that, these kind of like soliloquies about uh, whatever. And in, this, in my notes, I, I always write in all caps, no teachable moments. This is not a show for teachable moments. This is not a Sunday school lesson. This is an adventure story. Yeah. So anytime, like, and a part of it is like I grew up a pastor's kid so my <laughs> my alarm bells start going off oh, as soon yeah. as i sense that there's a moral to the story the thing is there is a moral to the story but but like as soon as you show your cards mm -hmm. you break the spell yeah. and so we're trying really hard to make sure that we just we're just telling the best story we can tell and i do think that there should be teachable moments but i think those moments ought to be at the breakfast table with mom and dad after they've watched the episode right yes not in the show yes the show is the show the show is yeah. a story and and those moments are wonderful when on the car drive you get to talk about hey what did you think about this thing you know yeah. but our job as storytellers is to is to not let it let ourselves drift into that zone so the the ranger's guide to Clipwood forest is definitely no teachable moments <laughs> um other than how to survive in a forest with <laughs> toothy cows in it well and that's very important yes <laughs> That's that's very cool, um, and I like that the no teachable moments because, and it's no offense to other art and media. Sure, yeah. But I totally. check out when I feel like I'm being preached at or yeah. whatever, and I think kids, they're they know when things are not. It's not an authentic story, and they're just being yeah totally told to like you need to do this, and and they're um, honest about it too. Like, yeah, they'll tell you, and they're like, oh. 
Yeah. Are we doing this now? Yeah. Can I say one one great example of that is uh, Sally Lloyd Jones, who wrote the Jesus Storybook Bible. Uh, she's a friend, and like those books are just wonderful. Like I highly commend them. Uh, but this this telling of the Bible mm-hmm. story uh, in a way that I wish that I had been able to read when I was a kid. Beautiful. And so anyway, she was invited to a uh, read for a Sunday school class, read one a section from her book. And she said the teacher stepped out and she was there with the kids and she's reading her story. And she was like, as she's reading this Old Testament story, the kids were literally scooting closer to her mm-hmm. on the floor. She said it was it was as if they wanted to be physically close to the story itself. They were so drawn in by it. And she said then she finished the story and the teacher wasn't back yet. And she, in a moment of panic, didn't know what to do next. And so she heard herself, to her horror, ask, what does the story mean to you? And she said the kids went from totally engaged to, she said it was as if she had put a physical burden on their shoulders. They slumped. And they were like, oh, I don't know. and they got squirmy and she lost them. Oh. And so it was such a good metaphor for this thing. It's like when it comes to the Old Testament, if you're telling the story about the Israelites crossing the Jordan on dry, you know, the Lord stopping the river so they could cross into Canaan. Don't ask them in that moment, what is a river that you have had to cross in oh, your wow. life? You know, let the kids get lost in the wonder mm-hmm. of a God who stops rivers and parts yeah. seas and and let the story do its work, right? And it doesn't mean that we don't find application and we don't look for what the Lord is teaching us in that thing, but I really feel like sometimes we just have to let a, let the kids sit in just the craziness that God became man and dwelt among us. You know what I mean? And and simmer in that before you start going, okay, now let's, let's you know, look behind the curtain and see what else is going on here. Yeah. Both things are important, you know, teachable moments are good. Uh, but the story ought to be a story first. Yeah, I think that's very good for adults to remember when we're working with children. And because even to us, we roll our eyes at oh, things yeah. like that. So why would we not think the children would totally. also... And you're like, ah, can you just tell the story? Yeah. You know, we're all guilty of it. Yeah. So with the Wing, wing Feather Saga, um, when did the idea come about? And how long had you had this idea and been thinking about it, putting it together before you committed, I'm going to write these? Uh, the, the idea kind of grew out of the desi- like the process, you know. I knew I wanted to write a fantasy novel because I loved those kinds of stories as a kid. My kids were at the age when I could read to them. Mm-hmm. I had read the Narnia books to them and a few others, and I, I was like, ooh, I got I to gotta do this. Like I, I'm tired of t- just talking about it. Um, and I kept having you know, little ideas for a story and then I'd hit a dead end and I didn't know why, but then I realized it was because I hadn't done the world building first. So you kind of have to draw the map, write the imaginary histories, come up with like what kind of technology they have in the world. Do they have gunpowder? Uh, like I had a character light a match and a, an editor was like, um, yeah, does that mean, like, matches require the same thing that gunpowder requires. Does that mean they have cannons and guns in this world, too? And I was like, oh, hmm. So, yeah, you have to think through all that stuff um, because you, you, just like the Lord did in Genesis, you build the world and then you tell the story. Yeah. So that's how it worked for me. That's cool. Um, was it was it hard for you to decide, I'm going to do this? Because that's a dawning process Whew. to think about that and um and you're you're a songwriter at the time and that's i mean there's maybe some similarities in telling stories because yeah, you're yeah. a storyteller already but um it's a big leap to go i'm gonna write a fantasy series and all of that's yeah. involved was that a big yeah, decision i think i i didn't know what i was getting into at the time. <laughs> yeah. but it was yeah it was a huge decision i remember that it was uh you know i had to tell my wife hey we were super into Lost at the time. Remember that show, <laughs> yeah, Lost? Yeah. And uh, before it ended terribly. But, but the when it was out, it was a fun way for us to spend time together and watch with our friends or whatever. And when I said, hey, I'm going to write this book, I'm tired of talking about it. I'm going to really do it. And I said, she was like, great. I would love it if you would stop talking about it and just do it. <laughs> and uh, and then um, and I said, it means that I my only time to write is at night. So it means we're not. I can't watch Lost with you anymore. So, you know, if you were out there and you are a, a writer that can't find time, I think the real question is, what do you have to give up? 
in order to make room for this thing that you want to make. So mm-hmm. I knew it was going to be hard and I knew it was going to take a long time. And I had to find carve out, I had to give up some fun things to make room to do it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, once you get a contract, I'm so grateful to have, because of music, was able to get, you know, demonstrate to a publisher that even if the book is terrible, I'll still sell some copies because I do shows. <laughs> I think that's why they took the risk on me. Um, and, uh, uh, then you have a contract and you have a deadline and you got a r- conference room full of, full of people who have, uh, who are, you're committed to, you've made a promise to. <laughs> so that's where the rubber meets the road. And you've, you're like, I really have to make this as good as I can make it. And, um, yeah, it was a 10 year journey of writing the story. Wow. Yeah. Um, did you have the ending in mind when you started? Uh, I had like a, a vague sense of the ending, mm-hmm. um, little little uh, vignettes almost of moments that I, I knew were crucial moments, but I didn't know why they mattered or how to get to them. So they were kind of like these little, I told somebody it was like uh, a family going to Disney World for vacation without a map. It's like, we're just gonna, we know it's south, we're just gonna drive and see how, see if we can find the signs to get there. And so that's kind of what it was like. And then when I got to the ending, the ending was not the ending that I thought it was gonna be. Like the thing that I was writing toward ended up not being what the story actually wanted. But, hmm. um, and so, yeah, it was a whole trippy experience. And there's obviously a beautiful metaphor in there about that oh, ending thanks. not being what you expected when you started, because yeah. that's yeah. that's true in our lives. Yes, yeah, for sure. And yeah. um, I know from reading the books, it, it definitely um, was emotional for me when we got to the end of that. So, Thank you, good. Um, yeah, I've really, I did really enjoy those. Um, so you're talking about having to give things up and in order to create the art that you want to make. And I think as creative people, um, artists, a lot of us kind of live by, well, I need inspiration to strike or we can be very, we can procrastinate a lot about things. And what have you learned about discipline and all of that that uh, you would say to other artists, students who are like, I want to do this thing, mm-hmm. and maybe they don't realize what all is really involved. Right. And uh, I would say a few things. First thing is uh, you don't have to. Uh, I just heard Kate De Camillo, who's a wonderful children's writer, uh, speak in Nashville last week, and she she said that she writes two pages a day. It's the first thing she does, she wakes up. She writes her two pages and then she's off to the other parts of her life that are um, less intensive, maybe. Um, but, and I, you know, I've read about Dickens or somebody like that back in the day had a 500 word count a day. No matter what, you woke up and you wrote 500 words. I don't remember exactly who it was, but that that's the, if you think of the whole thing, you'll, you'll get overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. If you think of it like this, you can do it, you know? And um, so that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would say is don't, uh, like if you it's your first time writing a book, think of it as your first book. Uh, give yourself a break. You know, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't have to be the great American novel. You're gonna hate it in five years, no matter what. You know, you're you're gonna write the best book you can, and if you keep going, you're gonna outgrow where you were, right? Um, and even in just the four books of the Wingfeather Saga, like I noticed when I was reading the audiobooks that. I cringed less in book four than I did in book one. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, I, I actually did learn some things along the way. So you just have to think of it of the long game. That's, yeah. that's what I would say. Just do a little bit of work at a time and have a long game yeah. philosophy. Yeah, and I think that's that's true in whatever field because I'm a visual artist. And mm-hmm. so um, working on that, I know I have to spend a certain amount of time every day and yeah. build those skills because you got, you got to have the fundamentals, that base to build from. and with music as a songwriter you have to be filling your mind with those things and working so that you have something to give when it's time to write yeah and there's something in the well it's so true and you just you stack up a whole bunch of time Mm -hmm. you know like you write a whole bunch of bad songs to get to the good one you know i'm just start i'm working on you're talking about visual art trying i still like to draw and and i'm trying aiden is teaching me how to paint now and so, uh, which I love that my son is the one who's now <laughs> teaching me how to do this. But uh, watercolors have always intrigued me. And so I've been trying to figure out how to make watercolors work. And I have next to my art desk at home, a stack of, you know, 
every time I finish a page of trying to paint a tree, put it in the stack and I'm just watching the stack grow. And I know because of my experience with writing books and writing songs that like by the time there are about 500 of those, mm -hmm. that I will be a better painter than I was at the beginning. And yeah. then you get to look back at the way you've grown and the way you've learned, but you can't, the only, it, 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 there's no key other than the work. Yeah. You know, you can't unlock it other than just put in the time. And some days you feel like I'm not making any progress, but then you see a thing yeah. or you hear a thing in your music or whatever and you go, oh, yeah, I didn't know I could do that. Yeah, exactly. And it's, that's the what keeps you going. Yes. Yeah, you keep running because there's this weird little yesterday I couldn't do this and today I can. Yeah. How does that work? Yeah. It's amazing. And it's so exciting as a creative person when, yeah. when you see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I uh, want to back up just a little bit if and talk a little bit about an album of yours that I love. Um, so Light for the Lost Boy. Oh, thanks. Um, when that came out, um, it came at a time that kind of perfect time for me to hear it. Mm. Um, and I just wondered with the first track on that album, Come Back Soon, um, there is an honesty in that song that um, I had been listening um, since Dancing in the Minefields. It was when I kind of came to know you and mm. uh, everything. And so when that album came out and I heard that first song, it felt... I don't want to say different from everything you had done, but it felt like there is a real depth, there's an honesty, there is a desperation almost in that song, a mm -hmm. cry, um, that met me in a place of doubt where wow. I was. Um, and so I wondered, can you talk a little bit about that album, that song in particular, yeah. and how the writing happened for that? Man, well, first of all, thank you. I'm so glad that that song was good for you or the the album um it that's yeah it was one of those things where i was i went into the studio with almost no songs just a few intimations of some song ideas uh and it was produced by ben shive who is my longtime producer uh one of my best friends but we also invited case and cooley who's another producer that i go to church with does produce like matthew perriman jones and I mean, a bunch of great artists, but has comes at it differently than Ben. And they were buddies and they were like, hey, let's try to kind of like the Paul Simon thing. Let's let's stir things up a little bit and make a record that doesn't that that makes us feel a little uncomfortable, get, you know, and uh, get experimental on some stuff. And uh, I was way into that idea. But I also just didn't have any songs. I'd been super busy and had been, you know, doing the subconscious songwriting, but not actually I didn't show up with very much and um, hoping that I would find some inspiration in the studio and that yeah that song was one that came out uh, was really influenced by uh, Bon Iver the Justin Vernon okay. that record that title self-titled album was had come out around there and I was so intrigued by the soundscape in mm -hmm. those and the way he sang and the way the guitar parts were kind of meandery there was this really fascinating way of making music um, that we were kind of letting that lead us a little bit. Uh, so anyway, but the funny, not funny at all. Uh, the surprising thing to me was that the I was tipping into a season of depression without knowing that that was what was happening. It was like there was a storm cloud on the horizon. And that's the heaviness that I hear in that record Yeah, is that there's something coming. And so we recorded all these songs and I was writing kind of about well, there's something going on me in me. I'm watching my kids grow up. I'm grieving that. Their adolescence is reminding me of my own adolescence and some pain that I experienced, uh, uh, even trauma that I experienced there. So it's stirring up things, you know, going into counseling, realizing some things. I had just turned 40. Um, I Yeah, there were all these weird milestones that I had reached. You know, I turned 40. I'd had my 20th wedding anniversary. My kids were teenagers. Like... It was just this a lot of huge shifts that were happening inside of me, and there was and it was, you know, when when the tectonic plates would shift, some steam would come out, <laughs> and that would be the song. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, and so I didn't know what was going on until I went on tour um, for that record and sang them every night with Caleb uh, Chapman and Will Chapman, who are now Colony House they, they, and oh, Scotty yeah. and their buddies. They were the band and the opening act, and um, and so I was thinking about 
those guys and their story and Will's and his story and my own story. And I was singing every night about the loss of innocence and the hope for redemption. And I didn't know it, but I was just like readying the, the Lord was like tilling the soil and getting me ready for a complete breakdown. <laughs> so after that tour, uh, I, yeah, I just was like, that was the depression that, that I fell into. Mm -hmm. So it, it was like, that was one of those moments where I think I was working it out on stage uh, in a way that may not have been super wise all the time uh, when I was make we were touring that album. But something was going on. Yeah. And so when I hear like the album cover, everything about that record kind of uh, tastes like that um, autumnal, the winter is coming <laughs> kind of feeling, um, which the, the beautiful thing to me is that the, uh, the Burning Edge of Dawn, the album that came out after that album was... I went into the studio without knowing that I was on the en at the end of the depression, you know, like those two albums were the bookends of this dip in oh, yeah. in my life. And, and I wasn't aware that I was dipping into something and I wasn't aware that I was getting out of it. It was like the, the writing process as the Lord arranged it was that I was documenting the very edge of the season. Does that make sense? Yeah. And those two albums, there's such depth lyrically i mean all your all your songs bring a lot of depth but those two um we just get so many layers and things and um it's it's fascinating to me that uh, your pain could help so many people mm -hmm. because i know for me like we've talked about how songs can reflect things about yourself mm -hmm. and you can see things in a different way because of that and i think it's a big blessing that you put out those two albums um Thank i think I'm sure not just for me, there's been a lot of people that hearing your true lyrics and honesty in that has really helped a lot of Thank people. You. So anyway, um, uh, so this morning you sang, Is He Worthy? And that might be a song that a lot of our listeners are gonna know have sang, sung in their churches. Um, with that song, did you anticipate that this was gonna become such a uh, popular song within churches and things? and? No idea. Yeah. No. I mean, the the funny thing is, like, I've written songs over the years that I thought were going to connect, and then they just didn't. Mm -hmm. So you you kind of learn to self protect by going, ah, maybe it will, but probably not. Ah, it's gonna be fine. And you, <laughs> uh, because you you always want the song to connect with people, and so uh, I thought that it was something special, you know, when we wrote it and recorded it. Ben added the piano part, and we. had put the children's Nashville Children's Choir sang on it. And uh, I really thought it was special, but I also thought the same thing about 50 other songs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where I was like, gosh, I think this is really good. And then um, and then it, either it wouldn't resonate at all or it would take a long time or whatever. So, man, it was just a, a gift. That's all. It was just a gift. Was there an intention that it could be a corporate worship song? Yeah, yeah. When, okay. when we were, Ben and I mapped out the Resurrection Letters Volume 1 album, we we sat down and we wanted there to be songs that were specifically about the resurrection. We wanted there to be songs that were about uh, that were had the, stood a chance to be corporate songs, and um, and then there was a third category, and I'm blanking on it, uh, but a, a kind of song I can't, I can't remember. But we had like a chart, and we we're like we're going to try to write three songs about this, three songs that fit this, and um, and so yeah that that song grew out of that. It was just like, yeah, it'd be fun to sing. And the thing is, I'm such a, I'm, I'm just a, a dork in some ways because I did, I was, I was so resistant to the, to the hymn writing corporate worship thing because everybody wanted every songwriter to do it. Yeah. And you know, there's some grossness in there. Like back in the day, those records were selling a lot. So there was a financial incentive to write worship songs. And I was very allergic to that. I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. So for many years, as the worship f trend uh, kind of exploded in Christian music, uh, and I'm not, to be clear, suggesting that people who are writing worship songs were just motivated by money. I'm talking about my own heart. Yeah. There was a temptation in me to go, ooh, I could be more successful if I wrote these kinds of songs. Um, so I resisted it. 
for a long time. And people would book me for concerts and say, hey, there's going to be like worship songs in the concert, right? And I'd be like, no, I don't do that. I do these kinds of songs. And so uh, then this Izzy Worthy came out and I was like, man, did I miss out on a lot of like a, uh, something that's really special and joyful. Getting like So now in all my concerts, I invite the crowd to sing on bigger moments because it's such a beautiful experience you know something happens and then i started thinking about my favorite artists and i'm like oh james taylor had sing-alongs in his shows yeah. <laughs> paul simon had, so why was i so resistant to doing that you know, over the years anyway uh so yeah i'm just really thankful i'm thankful that we that the song was not written to be a popular song the song was written um as a part of this bigger project and it just happened to resonate so it's it's like you know i would hate to have written a I would hate it if, like, the most popular song I wrote was one that I didn't love to sing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I love to sing this song. Yeah. Yeah. And I know going to your Easter shows, um, or one of them this past spring, that was a very cool moment. Because multiple times through the show, getting to sing together. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I think that's very cool. Awesome. I love yeah. that tour so much. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the tour that's about to come up because yeah. when this releases, you'll be headed out on the road for Behold the Lamb of God. Yeah. Um, for anybody who doesn't know what that is, yeah. if you yeah. want to give a little summary of that. Uh, it's a song cycle that tells the story of the incarnation. So it's a, it was written as a Christmas show because back in the, this is our 24th year of wow. doing the tour. Um, and so back in the year, it was 99, I think, um, I was, I was fairly fresh out of Bible college and I was pretty jazzed about having realized that Jesus was the heart of the whole Bible. And that was something that I missed as a kid. And so that realization that the Old Testament was also about Jesus um, uh, just lit me up. And I thought, gosh, what if there was a Christmas concert where, you know, I love the kind of like traditional Christmas stuff. Um, but I wanted, I was like, what if there was a concert where Santa wasn't invited? <laughs> and we could just sing about this story in this way because I missed it as a kid. There must be other people out there who have never realized that, you know, Moses and the Exodus and all these things were pointing to what Jesus was going to fulfill. And so we tried to, you know, I tried to write a cycle of songs that told that story. And it was just weird enough of an idea that it worked, I think, you know. Yeah. So we did it for four years before we recorded it so there was no album for the first four tours we just went out on the road and with this wonderful community of songwriters and put on the concert and it has somehow lasted this long so oh yeah and it's great so for any of our listeners who haven't been we'll link in the show notes to the tour schedule and please go out and see this show because it is amazing um, my you. wife and i have been a couple of times and it's so fun and like half the fun to me is the first half of the show yes which is like the show is all these singer songwriter friends mm -hmm. Um, who are believers. And, and so we do this in the round thing. So the first half of the show is just kind of us doing whatever song we feel like that night. Um, and there's stories and there's a lot of camaraderie on the stage. And then after the intermission, this group of friends gets to then tell you, sing through the story of, of uh, the Jesus that we know and love. So yeah. it's really, it's a, it's a, I hope we keep, I hope I'm still doing the show when I'm 60. So that's awesome. I hope you are too. <laughs> That's great. All right. So we have one last question that we wrap up with every time. What is a practice or something in your life right now that is helping you thrive? Huh? Okay. This is going to be a, a funny answer, but reading my Bible, <laughs> yeah, I don't mean a funny answer is like, it feels so obvious, but also I have never in my whole life had a really consistent, like, uh, practice of reading my Bible. Like I go in spurts, you know, and like, uh, you know, I'm going to force myself to read the whole Bible cover to cover and I, you do it and then you're like, whoo, finish that. And then you'd fall off the wagon. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in church, I, I go to an Anglican church. And so, you know, there's a, you read through the whole Bible story over the course of the year through the church calendar. So, you know, I was kind of was like, yeah, that's, that's my Bible reading. I'm reading it. I mean, I'm around it all the time. I read it when I am in the mood, whatever. Um, but, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I, I, something in me was like, I'm going to, oh, I know what it was. It was that I was watching the news. It was when the, the country was on fire. And it was like every morning you're like, what, what fresh hell is going to unfold on the t TV today? You know what I mean? Yeah. It was this awful season. And I was, I was worried about things and 
you know, all this crazy stuff was happening. And I would wake up in the morning and, and start looking at the, the news and reading or whatever. And I realized that it had become a kind of morning devotion, <laughs> that, that this awful dip into the, the brokenness of the world was the first thing that I was experiencing in my day. And so my wife and I, one thing is we started plugging our phones in, not by our bed. We, we plug them in in the armoire in the other room at the in, you know, in, in the evening. So the, uh, it's not the last thing we see when we wake up. It's not the first thing we see in the morning. Um, so I'll, I'll go two hours before I pick up my phone now. But I was like, I need to start reading my Bible. So I remember Tim Keller saying that if you read four chapters a day, you get the whole Bible every year. And so I, um, I read two chapters of the New Testament, two chapters of the Old Testament. And I made myself, I was like committed to myself that I wasn't going to do anything else until I did that. This all sounds like very obvious, but for some reason it stuck this time. That's correct. And so for, you know, two years now, you know, I've zoomed through all of it a couple of times and, and, uh, and have, and now I'm finally at the point where if I don't in the morning, the day feels wrong. I really genuinely miss miss that time of, of quiet and engagement with God's word. And so, I mean, as simple as it is, like just finding the self-discipline to make yourself um, get up that 30 minutes extra early or whatever it is, four chapters a day is pretty doable. Yeah. And, and the other thing is like, uh, you know, I've had different Bibles over the years. I'm not one of those guys who's got the beat up Bible that he's had forever. I decided on one Bible and I've got to, you know, I'm engaging it. I'm underline. I'm not an underliner. So I've been underlining. I've been, I put a little dot next to the chapter once I've read it. So it's easy to, if, to know where I am in the process. Yeah. So little tiny little practical things. And like I have found Brandon and I were just talking this morning about how, um, being self-disciplined in one area of your life makes it easier to be self-disciplined in others. That's very true. And so, uh, you know, some like uh, sins that happen in my head have been a little easier to, to overcome because I've gotten in the habit of aiming my brain toward uh, scripture and also memorizing scripture has been huge. So I, I know that's a Sunday school answer, but that's just been the truth for me for the last couple of years. It's yeah. been a crazy couple of years and and being on a regimen of reading my Bible every day has been super helpful. That's awesome. So. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for taking time. We really yeah. appreciate it. And looking forward to the concert tonight. Thank you.